Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to an epi another episode of A Positive Response. Um, I'm really excited today. I have a fantastic guest, uh, Karin Dahab, and she um, got her bachelor's in sexology, which is really interesting. Um, so Karine actually is from Montreal, where I live. So finally, I have a guest from where I live, which I think is really exciting. Um, she also is, like me, an immigrant that came to this country um, and has, you know, obviously uh, foreign parents. Um, and that's the cool thing about Canada, like everyone is kind of an immigrant. She works for a nonprofit in Montreal whose mission is to help youth at risk and uh, homeless people and they do a variety of um, outreach basically. And she's going to uh, talk a little bit more about what it is specifically that she does with them. Um, another thing is that uh, what we want to really kind of touch base on today is the importance that a sexual education can have on society. Um, especially like, you know, we know that our point of view is a Western one because we live in Montreal, Canada. Um, but we both are immigrants coming from different, uh, very different backgrounds. So we want to talk a little bit more about this. And I think Karine is obviously the perfect person to talk to this about because who has a bachelor's in sexology? <laughs> like, not that many people that I know of. So without saying much more, I want to introduce Karim. How did you get into um, studying sexology and kind of like how did you get into your current obviously job and what it is that you do now? Um, so how did I get into to sexology is I think I was always attracted to it, but in high school without realizing what it was like, well, I would do like uh, gender stereotypes, talk about age, uh, women violence and, and things like that that would happen in high school, not realizing it was just always something that attracted me more, right? Once we went, entered college, CJEP here in Quebec, uh, I remember studying a lot about uh, female genital uh, mutilation and trying to understand, and I was getting more and more into everything that had to do with uh, psychology, sociology, and I knew I wanted to be in that field. I just didn't know what. And then one day I saw that we are the only place in North America that really offers such a depth, like in-depth program in sexology. Amazing. So, um, so I applied, I got accepted. Both my parents are born and raised in Egypt. Mm -hmm. On my father's side, my grandfather's Turkish, my grandmother's Armenian. Amazing. And on my mom's side, her mother's Syrian and my grandfather's Egyptian. Amazing mix, like such a Middle Eastern soup. It's, it's, that's <laughs> what it is. That's exactly what it is. It just makes sense, right? So we exactly. stuck to the, to the sea right there. Exactly. So, um, and, and, I, and I grew up with a lot of first and, and second immigrant generations and not realizing the impact and the languages we've had around us and, and how we would talk about women. And, and I had a lot of guy friends too. So I kind of, when I was younger, fell into that trap too of like, like being so also have a, a vulgar language and a violent language because it's what you know. Exactly. And when you grow, you start to learn and, and the importance of how the culture and the society were made and, and all the, the, those, those beliefs and values that, that we carry and transmit to, to our children. It's, it, the impact that it has on the individual is quite surprising. And these are things I continue to see and learn. And right now I'm super happy to be, anyways, in Quebec, a colored person, a person of diversity who yeah. is a sexologist, right? Because now I am also a representation for the kids sometimes that I go do workshops for in schools. And it's always the first question they ask me, where are you from? And then we start playing that game of like, well, where do you think I am? Because I know I can pass as many different yeah. uh, the cultures. Mm -hmm. So, but it allows them to see somebody that is a little bit closer to them and understands a little bit more their reality. Yes. It is a double-edged sword because sometimes there's also the fear of judgment. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and uh, with my work, uh, I was hired initially for the purpose of uh, juvenile prostitution. And when I was doing a field research for the section in Montreal where we were, there was already some services for women being done, but I, the huge lack that I noticed the most was there was nothing being offered for, for boys and young men. And, and when girls would get a sex ed class, for example, well, I would ask, where, what are the boys doing? And they're like, oh, they're going to gym class. So again, the sole responsibility of sexual education 
lies on women, which which I was a little bit shocked. So this is really I, shocking. Yeah, I didn't know yeah, that. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. So uh, so as of 2014, I had built a whole program for boys. And yes, me too. I am definitely looking for men who are willing to participate, who are, you know, because they do need male examples too, a little bit, especially at such a young age, because they do fall into these very surprising, um, say like, I'm a bad boy. I'm going to be like, uh, they still bring up like John Cena as a, as a like physical example of manliness, right? It's very interesting to, to see it's still the same thing. And, and, and it does build toxic masculinities. And, and if this, you know, so, but it was, it became, I think it became my, my favorite thing. I didn't realize I would fall in love with, with giving education to boys as much as that. Even if you are in a very open environment, I think there still are levels depending on what kind of a minority you are in that environment or your social economic background that also affects the sexual education and then there's like sexual repression the thing that that really stands out especially for for young kids is the is the easy access to porn but because they don't have any other information or especially when you're young it kind of shifts your brain and takes out all the creative um, aspects of it and all the fantasies that are very healthy to have mm -hmm. you know so now we're giving you a, a script we're giving you actions we're giving you bodies Mm -hmm. but, and then you're starting to think that this is what it's supposed to look like. And I've had a nurse call me and say, I have a 14 year old with ED, erectile dysfunction. And then we spoke about it more and it was like, well, he, the girl didn't look like the actors in porn. But that comes back to sexual education. Yes. Number one is Iraq. Wow. And number two is Egypt, wow. who are the biggest porn consumers in the world. Largest average sessions. So they, they stay there long. It's not a two minute session there. Wow. Okay. And for those countries is Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar. So Kuwait is number one, Saudi is number four, Qatar is number five. Just using proper words, proper terms, understanding limits. Wow. I cannot and will never say I will prevent sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. That is not a thing. What I can do through education and what a parent can do through education or what society and a culture can do through education is not have it repeated and being denial, denounced the moment it happens because now you're recognizing the signs by using the proper language. Exactly. So this is how far it can go. Not a story I had to work with, but really it's, it, it's a horror story, but sometimes I think to shake certain people, I need to use this story. Um, somebody told me about a case that it was a three-year-old who, who went to the doctors and kept complaining about tummy issues. They checked, fine. Parents kept going back, checked, fine. I don't know, I think after the fourth session of the tummy issues, they realized tummy was vagina. And the kid was diagnosed with chlamydia. Because we don't use the proper terms, so the child only knew what the tummy was because it was the area that was uh, affected. For me, as an ed educator, is to give you all the scientific-based answers so you can make an informed choice. Exactly. We, as a government, Canadian government, when we do welcome our new arrivals, my goodness, we need to to start understanding what a dating is. Dating that you don't catcall women in the streets. No. That you don't touch people in the street. <laughs> but, but they come from situations where their governments let them get away with that. Of course. Like, it's, it's, it goes far. That's what, it's, if your government's allowing you to, to get away with certain, of course you're going to be rewarded and say, well, I guess it's okay. Yeah. No, it's not, you know. It's actually consent. It's actually respect of another. It's actually, it's all of that. But just the, the question of consent, and I think, I think, there's a lot of pressure when it comes to the word consent. Yes. And I'm like, okay, just relax a bit. Like everybody relax. I'm like, and, and, and I guess, and people are looking at me weird because when I say the interesting thing about COVID from my point of view mm -hmm. and putting aside, of course, I, I know there are deaths. I know there, you know, people have suffered, but from, and I see it is people continuously started to ask for consent. Yes. Can I come in your house? Yes. 
are you comfortable with this? We're forced to kiss our uncles or aunts or because it's rude. Exactly. And I've noticed some of my friends' parents do it and I'm, and the kid doesn't want to kiss me and I'm, I'll stop it right there and I'll be, no, it's fine. Give me a high five. Give me a fist. Yeah. I, I respect. So as an individual, respecting not only the child's limits, mm-hmm. finding a solution exactly. if they're comfortable. Now you're empowering a child indirectly by saying, I respect your body. I respect that you don't want to kiss me. And when you're ready to be with me, it's fine. Let's fist bump, let's high five, let's kick exactly. five, whatever it is. If you don't want to look at me, don't look at me. You, at some point, it's fine. It's okay. Yeah. You know, it's but really- but there's that fear in our culture to be like, oh, I raised the wrong kid. They didn't say hi. But let me push it further. These ideologies, even then, it's like I was sexually abused at the age of nine. But I, I remember thinking, I have to say because I don't want to be rude to the person. But but and again, I can't blame my parents for that. I blame a whole culture and a whole, there's nothing to blame for my parents for that. But it's, 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 it becomes ingrained and it stays with us for the longest time. Which you see like that we would have to do differently for this to be less and less of an issue basically where people can come forward or these things happen less and less. Well, look, um, it's in Canada, like in Canada, we're lucky there are women rights. There are still a lot of issues concerning women rights, but compared to other certain countries, yes, there's, we have certain privilege that I do have to acknowledge. It's nice to set up laws. Yeah. It's nice. <laughs> but if you don't apply them. Yeah. So you need a shift in what the government action actually do. You need to train your people so okay you're gonna apply that that the police is gonna arrest because there's been a rape or is the rape is gonna get away because you paid the person money yeah you understand so if if judgment i think in egypt the first case of sexual harassment or sexual abuse was like in 2013 or 12 like i have to look it up again and there was a movie who was relating to that it was after the 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 arab spring it has to start with with one person and slowly and people are putting their lives at risk in in these countries i find that these issues seem to be very universal like they are worse in certain places but there is a universal issue here like that we're all kind of facing no matter where we live you know we have to give that education that's the other problem we minimize women's issue exactly but yet Yet, and this is where I want to use that quote I was telling you. Amazing Moroccan reader, uh, writer Leila. and uh, Leila Slimani just talks about the hidden sex lives that women had, have or always had and also. But the Turkish writer, all over the, the Mediterranean, the concept of honor is still considered to lie between a woman's thighs. <laughs> wow. Society tries to control the outside of a woman yeah. again how she looks how she walks how she talks how she crosses her legs is she polite does she say yes and please and thank you does she not talk back you know these are things that we're controlling but we'll give you your emotions mm-hmm. like that we could call you a crazy bitch but we'll give you your emotions men is the opposite exactly like yes there is a physical aspect now due to social media also yeah. it's, it's like yeah. get them get, getting the muscles being clean there's, there's a whole new market on on the beauty side of things yeah. but we control men on the emotional level yeah. you cannot cry you cannot say you're sad so at the end we have men who are completely repressed emotionally and they have two emotions i'm happy and i'm angry yeah. actually in in, in in our countries I want to be like LGBTQ. I'm all for. I'm a huge ally, and and I I I've seen friends of of similar backgrounds suffering yeah. because of 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 who they are and who they love. And but at the same time, I'm like, how can you support LGBTQ rights if you can barely support the minimal women's rights? Exactly. And all that has to come together. Yeah you know, but I can't tell you there's one solution because you have to involve everybody in it. Exactly. Everybody needs to be involved. Yeah. I, I, I think that's actually, that's, that's very, very true. And that hasn't come up before in all the conversations. I think it's not necessarily like 
men need to figure it out. Women need to figure it out. It's like you said, I think everyone has to be involved in how we can kind of progress forward and kind of raise a better, um, just like a more, you know, change ourselves and raise a better generation, I would hope, you know, uh, where we're more aware. Yeah, totally. Awesome. So I just want to thank Kareen today for coming um, and just obviously, well, not for coming, but for doing my Zoom, <laughs> for doing the Zoom dialogue. Thank you, sweetie. Like it was honestly, I, I love your perspective. And I think that, um, I think it's, it's really hard, actually, the job that you do. Like, I, I don't think it's an easy job, you know, at all. And I'm, I'm just kind of glad, you know, you're doing it. And there are people like you doing it because I, I don't think it's easy and uh, working with, like these kinds of backgrounds and, you know, certain youth and homeless, like it, it's not easy. So I just really want to thank you for doing that work. And I want to thank you for taking the time and um, talking with me. Thank you. And thank you for thinking of me. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, so, so you'll have to translate that one. Uh, but I, I'm really, I'm really blessed to, to, and humbled that you, you thought of me and invited me here because I, I think, we need to talk more about our, our experiences also and recognize and be the voice probably for those who can't speak. So definitely, merci beaucoup, j'apprécie. Merci, merci, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you.